Meanwhile, you, you have also been the uh, editor in chief of, uh, for a prestigious journal, uh, Material Science and Engineering A. How long have you been the, the editor in chief? Uh, what are your responsibilities and how do you enact them? So, I became involved with Material Science and Engineering A about the same time I became chair, circa 1998, not as editor in chief, just as editor. Um, this was important to me because even as a graduate student, I always found that MSEA, as we call Material Science and Engineering A, Structural Materials, was a journal that then the editor, I still remember, was uh, Professor um, Herb Herman from SUNY. Uh, this was a journal that I always felt had rigorous reviews, but offered good feedback to the authors. Unlike other journals who would simply just sort of reject or, or accept a paper, I always found MSCA reviewers to be quite constructive. And so when the opportunity came, uh, I was certainly flattered and, and willing to help the journal. Over the years, and I can't really remember when I became editor-in-chief, but, um, well, actually I do, because this will be, I'm going on to my 10th year. Mm -hmm. So it was then in 2010, around that time, that uh, they must have asked me to become editor-in-chief. And as editor-in-chief, my responsibility is... Uh, on one level, like other editors, um, um, process papers, assign them to reviewers and make mm -hmm. decisions on their acceptance, modification, or rejection. But as editor-in-chief, it, it includes the responsibility of working with the other editors to set policies, change scope, mm -hmm. adjudicate conflicts. Um, and it's been a it's been a terrific team. In fact, uh, um, this today my one o'clock meeting is the editorial board meeting for MSCA. Um, so, uh, what is your vision for for the journal in the next uh, like uh, five to to ten years? So, MSCA has increased dramatically in terms of impact factor. Um, our goal is to continue to increase the impact factor. I think it's around four right now. We'd like to be have an impact factor closer to that of ACTA, which is closer to 10. Um, continuing to serve as um, a unique place where research on structural materials is presented, we, in recent years, the additive manufacturing community has found MSCA a very attractive venue, in part because our focus on the actual material science and engineering issues of AEM is unique. It's not just the process, but actually the faces, the microstructure, the uh, non-equilibrium uh, issues related to AEM. And so continuing to work on cutting-edge fields, um, multi-component, um, alloys is also becoming um, quite popular in the journal if you look at the paper submission. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to both explore strategic areas as well as um, make sure that the community sees us as the place to publish research on structural materials. On the uh, research side, uh, despite uh, your full uh, administrative duties, you maintained a large research group, uh, raised uh, tens of million uh, research dollars, and acquired uh, extensive uh, laboratory facilities. You published about 250 papers during your uh, tenure at uh, UC Davis. How did you manage to, uh, to be so successful in research when you have full administrative duties? You know, timing, mean, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's It's always hard to say. I think perhaps it's the same um, philosophy that I've used as advisor and department chair, which is um, hire people who are smarter than you are, let them do their job and support them. Um, the, the, the role of the dean is particularly important in setting an example for the faculty. So I found that having a productive research portfolio again gave me um, the perfect platform to tell the faculty that if I'm still bringing research, so can you. But at the same time, I think it gave me 
the insight so that when I was evaluating a faculty member, I could truly understand if there is a pause in research funding because there's a certain there's a certain um, situation in the federal government that's leading to, to lower funding. I, I will feel it as a PI, and therefore I think it makes me a better administrator in understanding what faculty go through. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also provides me with a real up-and-close insight into the systems at a university. Mm -hmm. And when they're not working, if they're not working for me as dean, they're not working for the faculty either. So then I can tackle those problems, knowing that they're important problems, because it's things you see, whether it's checking your grants, whether it's laboratory renovations. If I'm having a challenge with those as dean, so are all my faculty. So then I can work on um, fixing those. You were elected as an uh, ASME fellow in 2006 and in 2013 you received a number of very prestigious uh, awards. You received the ASM International uh, Gold Medal Award and the Edward Demir Campbell Memorial Lectureship. You were elected as a fellow of uh, Materials Research Society and um, you were elected to National Academy of Engineering, one of the highest uh, honors for engineers. According to NAE, you were elected for your contributions to novel processing of metals and alloys and for leadership uh, in engineering education. Uh, can you give more details for, for that? It's ironic, isn't it, that 2013 ended up being such a special year? <laughs> um, I, Really, I think there's a layer of randomness, the fact that all these awards came together in 13. Uh, and had no way of predicting that. Many of these awards and nominations are done without your knowledge, so needless to say, it was a huge surprise in, in many, if not all, cases. And it, I think it was a um, culmination of the great work that the group um, had pursued. Um, always loved having a very... Um, intellectually rich culture with the graduate students, not just in their own research, but encouraging them to work with each other. Uh, often I tell the students, you're going to learn as much from me as you are from your colleagues. So work with them, collaborate with them, help them when they need help, because someday you will need help. And I think that turned into some very productive um, uh, interdisciplinary papers that would have not been possible if everybody was just doing their own work and not really um, collaborating. Um, creating that atmosphere in the research group um, also involves getting to know people personally. So as you know, you've been to many a uh, barbecue at my house, mm -hmm. bringing them over. Uh, and that goes back to my days as a graduate student, right? I mm -hmm. love being able to interact with the faculty at a different, more personal level. And so I've continued to do that to this date. And uh, that's the day I cook for everybody. And uh, it's an opportunity to get to know people, um, which is just so important in everything we do. People uh, call, called you Super Dean at UC <laughs> Davis. You were the dean, a highly successful researcher and the advisor of many graduate students. People said you were extremely nice. Uh, your, your students said no matter how busy you were, you were always available to help. What do you think of the Super Dean title and how did you make time for everyone? <laughs> uh, let me just say that I've never heard of that title, by the way. and it. Um, it brings, um, it brings to memory uh, an interesting uh, interaction that I had with my son, and he was very young, actually both son and daughter. We had, if you remember, picnic day at UC Davis, which is the day where all the alumni got invited back to, and about 60,000 people show at the Davis campus. And we decided for the first time to have these tents where each of the schools would have the dean meet alumni and friends. And so it was my turn to go to the tent and I was with the family and I said, I have to go and spend the next two hours um, busy at the tent. And 
Mike Alejandro and Loris says, well, what do you mean? Well, it's a tent that's, it's, it's called Meet the Dean. And they both laughed and they looked at me. Now, who would want to meet you? And, and I say that anecdote because I think it's, A, it's always sobering to listen to uh, the perspective of, of a child. Um, at the same time, um, I, I've thoroughly always enjoyed people. I think that regardless of what you do, researcher, administrator, faculty member, a rule of thumb is that that I always remind my faculty, my deans, it's always about people. It's not about the rules. It's always about people. And if you approach problems that way, um, it gives you a very powerful tool. And 40% of any big conflict is people. Mm. And um, I've always enjoyed doing that. And so... Um, not sure why they call me super thing, but I've never heard that before. <laughs> you were the uh, provost, the executive uh, vice chancellor for two years uh, at UC Davis as uh, UC Davis transitioned to a new uh, chancellor. You mentioned that there was an uh, interesting story uh, to share. Can you tell us a, a little bit more details about that? Oh yes, that's uh, that was a very stressful um, part of uh, of my life at the time. So, um, the provost and executive vice chancellor who hired me, uh, Virginia Hinshaw, who was um, fabulous, as I said, uh, left to become the president of the University of Hawaii. Shortly before her departure, Virginia and then Chancellor Larry Vanderhoof asked me to step in as provost and executive vice chancellor while they did a search and. You know, I thought about it, and what I said to them was, you know, you have some exceptional deans in place who can do this. I have a full research load. I'm in the middle of hiring 100 faculty, and I have two young kids at home. I would rather not do this. Um, the They decided to appoint a search committee who again approached me, and I said no. And, and it was a third attempt to get me to accept it. And again, I said, no, we went through the search and in the middle of interviewing candidates, I went to meet with the chancellor. And I never forget the day I walked into his office and I said, okay, Larry, I'm here to tell you um, what I think. And he said, what do you think about what? The candidates? I said, well, yeah, isn't that what we're meeting? He said, no. I said, well, why are we meeting? He says, because you need to do this job. <laughs> and it was profoundly um, flattering because I truly thought that um, my colleague from the College of Environmental Sciences would have made a fabulous Provost TVC. So eventually I said, okay, can you give me some time? Let me talk to Julie. This was on a Wednesday. And he said, okay, can you tell me Friday? Okay. So I went home and I had uh, a nice discussion with Julie. And I said, look, I can't turn my back on the campus. I don't know why they really want me to do this, but I'm willing to do it. I love learning, and this is certainly going to be a learning experience. So I said to Larry, okay, I'll do it, but before I do it, you have to tell me you're not going to retire, because at the time he had been the longest serving chancellor in the UC. And Larry's words were, and he's passed on right now, wonderful man. Uh, Enrique, I'm going nowhere until I know that the campus is in good hands. I said, okay, fair enough. So I accepted the job. I'm driving my daughter to volleyball on a Sunday and Larry calls. We're ready to make the announcement to campus. Let me read it to you. And the announcement reads, da 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 Professor Enrique Lavernia for a, an appointment as Provost TVC for up to two years. And I said, whoa, Larry, who said two years? I said, I agreed to do this for a year. I said, oh, well, you know, if we do two years, I can make what's called a term appointment, which means you don't carry the title interim. <laughs> yeah, if beyond two years, there needs to be a search, but it's important that you don't carry the title interim because you make budget decisions. I said, I don't know, Larry, that makes me nervous. I said, oh, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. So I accepted the job, and six months into the job, his office was next to mine. He walked into my office, and he said, Enrique, I woke up this morning and decided that 
the campus is in good hands, so I'm going to retire. <laughs> and I just shook my head and I said, clearly you're smarter than I am because I should have seen this coming. Uh, I had asked for a letter um, giving me the right to return as dean at any time, which is in retrospect one of the smartest things that I did. And the College of Engineering was being run by then my former associate dean, Bruce White, who was a fabulous dean. And so that was uh, the transition that led to Linda Katehi arriving at Davis, and then eventually I decided to go back to uh, becoming uh, the Dean of Engineering again, and it worked out. So in uh, 2015, about uh, 13 years after you left UC Irvine, you came back to UC Irvine. Uh, you left as a department chair, and then you came back um, as a provost and the executive uh, vice chancellor. Coming back after 13 years, how, how did you feel? <laughs> so I was um, getting ready to go on sabbatical at Davis, and um, Irvine called because um, they were looking for a provost DVC. And that was not a hard decision because um, we enjoyed Irvine very much. Both kids had left Davis by then. Um, Southern California is certainly a much more interesting place to be uh, from a cultural and uh, um, geographical standpoint. Um, and so it was easy to accept the invitation to apply. It was very um, easy. I my interactions with then Chancellor Gilman, who is today the Chancellor, were very easy and uh, clearly somebody I could work with. Yes. And as my daughter said to me, I says, wait a second, you're giving up a year sabbatical to go do this job that was so <laughs> tough the first time? I says, you're not very smart, are you? <laughs> but it's, um, it's, it was a great decision for both of us uh, to return and it's been, uh, it's been almost five years of uh, just tremendous energy and excitement. So as provost, uh, you are UCI's uh, chief academic and uh, operating officer with a primary responsibility for the university's teaching and the research enterprise, which uh, includes uh, 16 schools and nearly um, 5,500 faculty and more than uh, 190 degree uh, programs. What are the opportunities and the challenges uh, for UC Irvine? UC Irvine is in a very um, uh, exceptional um, time and place in its current state. We're in the process of implementing a five-year strategic growth plan that involves adding 500 new faculty in five years, um, becoming the campus of choice for undergrads, um, increasing fundraising and research expenditures. And in all fronts, we're making uh, just tremendous progress. Just this year, we announced that we had 120,000 applications for the freshman class, mm -hmm. second in the country only after UCLA, uh, which is incredible because that growth has occurred in the last uh, five, six years. We are um, have broken fundraising um, uh, records. We're in the midst of a $2 billion campaign and have already raised $840 million. Um, Orange County is part of the reason why you see Irvine so successful. It's uh, 3 million people. It's the sixth mm -hmm. largest county in the country. It's wealthy, it's diverse, and it's engaged. So unlike some of our sister campuses that are in constant um, conflict with the communities they are in, uh, Orange County loves UCI, and that makes a big difference when we want to grow, build, expand. It's it's not a battle, it's uh, support. So it's been a lot of fun to be at UCI at this time. Mm -hmm. We are creating new and unusual programs, such as a new College of Health Sciences that was recently endowed with $200 million to put together medicine, nursing, uh, population health, and uh, pharmacy in one school to be able to train students in a different way. Mm -hmm. The campus is extremely diverse. We have more Pell-eligible students at UCI than the entire Ivy League put together. 
Um, so the experiment here is the combination of bringing in students, providing them with access, first gen minority students with absolute academic excellence, Nobel Prize winners, National Academies. And so far it's just a tremendous success and I'm very proud and humbled to be part of this experiment. In addition uh, to being the provost, uh, you are a distinguished professor of material science and engineering. Uh, you will still maintain your high research productivity and your position as the editor-in-chief for MSEA. You have published uh, more than 600 uh, journal papers and 200 uh, conference publications and have been awarded uh, 11 patents on topics ranging from uh, nanomaterials uh, to aluminum alloys. Now you are a, a super provost, basically. <laughs> How do you find time to do all of these? Oh, you know, there's no secret. Timing is um, um, perhaps part of my hyper personality. Um, I like to get up extremely early, as you probably know from my email <laughs> hours. But again, it's uh, um, surround yourself with really smart people. Let them do their job. Encourage them. Um, and again, as an academic, being continuing to be, to, to be productive gives me a great platform to get the faculty to listen because they don't see me as just an administrator. In the academic world, they say that once you become an administrator, you go over to the dark side, right? <laughs> so I've been trying not to go over to the dark side. And as dean, I've been able to work on issues of space, new buildings, because I know as a faculty member that we need to do that. Um, and so it's it's been tremendously um, um, enjoyable. Um, in the last four and a half years, we have hired 13 new deans, six vice chancellors, campus council, chief of police, and a new director for a museum that we're starting. And it's just not the numbers, it's the fact that in every case we've hired our top candidate. And I think the reason is people see the environment, the work environment, and the energy at the campus and they want to join and it's um, it's just been terrific. Your most recent awards include the 2020 Acta Material Gold Medal Award and the election to the Chinese Academy of Engineering as a foreign member. Uh, you will receive the Actor Material uh, Gold Medal and uh, present an overview of your research in two days at, at the TMS uh, annual meeting. What specific topics will you talk about? So what I am going to attempt to do during the Acta lecture, and, and I must tell you uh, how um, humble, flattered, and surprised I was. Acta has always been uh, the gold standard. It's what I'd like MSCA to to. Um, turn into. Um, but it's also been the place where we send papers and you get very critical um, reviewers. Um, so it's been just tremendously uh, um, positive um, in my life when I learned um, about this, this award. So what I'm going to try to do is put my career from the beginning till today in perspective via the topics that I've published in ACTAMET over the years. So starting with non-equilibrium processing, talking about um, nanostructured materials, followed by um, hierarchical structures, and ending with additive manufacturing, which is what we've been working on. Mm -hmm. And I have 20 minutes to do it, so <laughs> it's been a tremendous uh, challenge. But again, um, Dr. Baolong Zhang, Dr. Yi Zhang Zhou sitting with me looking at papers and their amazing work at putting the slides together is uh, the reason why I'm able to give it. In addition to the uh, awards uh, we talked about, uh, you also received a, a number of uh, other awards. Uh, in 2019, uh, you were awarded an honorary, honorary uh, uh, doctorate of science in technology from uh, Aalto University in Helsinki, uh, Finland. 
In 2018, you received uh, the Distinguished uh, Engineer, Engineering Educator Award by the National Engineers Council. And uh, in 2016, you received uh, the Alexander Humboldt uh, Foundation uh, Research Award as well as the TMS uh, Leadership Award from the TMS uh, Society. And in 2015, you were inducted into the Hispanic uh, Hall of Fame um, by the Hinek uh, Great Minds in STEM. You also received the Hispanic Engineer uh, National Achievement Award and the Society for the Advancement uh, of uh, Caicos and the Native Americans in Science uh, Distinguished uh, Scientist Award in, in 2011. So you received a lot of uh, international awards. Uh, can you uh, can you uh, talk? Uh, can you give a little bit more details on that? So, at the, I mean, I think that goes back to the um, real um, beauty of uh, research and how it brings together um, different cultures, um, um, people from very different backgrounds, all working on the same platform of research issues. I think these awards just reflect my passion and good fortune of engaging um, with international collaborators in uh, in-depth ways. Uh, my sabbatical in 1997 and the Max Planck led to research relationships uh, that continue even today. Um, Professor Horst Hahn um, is in fact a distinguished visiting professor at UCI, and it was my research with him that led to the Humboldt Senior Research Award. Similarly, I started a collaboration from my days at MIT, actually, with Finland mm -hmm. that continued over the years. I ended up on an, ex on an external advisory board um, of scholars that worked on the uh, what was then the establishment of Alto, which was formed from three different universities in Finland. And I continued that collaboration and I was very surprised uh, and, and very honored by that uh, honorary doctorate um, because I've watched them do exceedingly well under the new construct of uh, Alto University. Um, unfortunately, I actually lost my very good friend and colleague to a a heart condition, uh, Mari Veistinen, with whom I have a number of patents and papers, uh, very, passed away very suddenly a few years back. But the collaborations continue. And I think similarly with the awards related to um, uh, Hispanic uh, uh, um, students, uh, Hispanic faculty, um, Diversity is a really important component of the success of any academic program, something we take very seriously. Because of my um, birth um, as, a, as Cuban, and I speak obviously um, Spanish fluently, I've leveraged that to be able to address young students and faculty and help them expose, uh, be exposed to, to the opportunities uh, of higher education that this country offers that uh, are truly transformative in terms of their lives and opportunities. And it's, it's always cute when I show up to these meetings and I talk to them in Spanish because that's the last thing they expect. Uh, but I think it sends a message that if I can be standing here, so can you. And I think that's a powerful message uh, that we all need to continue to uh, um, um, to pursue um, my relationship with uh, um, uh, former students, colleagues, collaborators in China uh, has continued from the very early years. Some of my first PhD students were Chinese and I've been visiting China since, my goodness, the early 90s. And uh, it's been amazing to watch that country transform itself uh, by investing in education and infrastructure. Um, and despite some of the current challenges that we have, um, I think that it's a remarkably um, rich culture with a passion for learning. Uh, and so I was very honored when I was notified just this year, as you know, of, of that election 
to the um, National Academy of Engineering of China. Um, the induction ceremony is supposed to take place in May or June, but I don't think that's going to be the case. So I am just hoping uh, that this current um, health crisis passes mm -hmm. quickly um, and uh, everyone is, is, ends up uh, doing uh, well. So you are a member of uh, AIME's uh, Member Society TMS, as well as a member of ASM, uh, ASME, and uh, MRS. Uh, in fact, you are a fellow of all these uh, societies. When did you first um, hear about AIME and uh, TMS? Uh, how, did you, how did your involvement progress over the years? You know, I um, credit um, so TMS is a society that I've belonged to for the longest. I think, I, I think I'm a member since 1982, if the record served me right. And that's when I started as a graduate student. And as a graduate student at MIT, uh, these societies are very active. Uh, it's really important um, for students to get engaged. Over the last 33 years, it's been a privilege to be able to be affiliated with societies like TMS. Um, providing a platform for professional networks, for learning, for staying in touch with former students, providing an international platform where people from all over the world converge to talk about important research um, issues. So I can't stress enough how important it is for students. Now, even as early as undergraduate, uh, um, the, their undergraduate years to become engaged in these societies because I think the programmatic richness has increased many fold since I was a, a student and the resources that are available to them are uh, very powerful. So how has a membership uh, benefited uh, you in your career? How do you see societies benefiting people in the field of material science and engineering today? So, I mean, as I've, I've just mentioned, the creation of uh, networks of uh, um, education, support, teaching, research, um, together with industry is a very important component of uh, anybody doing research today, whether um, in academia uh, or in industry or in national labs. I think it's benefited me tremendously if I look at um, how much um, of my research has been touched by these professional societies, whether providing opportunities to meet with other researchers, taking advantage of uh, the many tools that they offer, um, and providing support to our graduate and undergraduate students in terms of job opportunities, um, connections um, with other communities, and um, international engagement. Um, so I look forward to watching how the influence of these professional societies continues to grow as the new generation um, hopefully takes advantage of them. You have advised about 45 PhD students and about uh, 35 uh, master students. Your graduate students learned a lot from you. What advice do you have for other graduate students uh, for them to be successful in the field of uh, material science and engineering? Well, hopefully, I think that some of the um, habits, practices, and philosophies that they learn while in graduate school um, to always keep an open mind, um, work well with your peers, um, take advantage of opportunities that are presented to you, and never be shy to fail. Um, a paper rejected, a proposal rejected, it's painful, but it's an opportunity to learn if you look at it that way. And I think that it's, um, it, it's a very powerful um, piece of advice uh, to always remember that it's about people. You need, you need to tackle the problems that are in front of you, understanding um, where people are coming from and their position, and keeping an open mind. Um, if, you can, if you can take your ego and put it in the drawer and approach a problem without it getting in the way, 
uh, I can guarantee you that the outcome will be better. In your opinion, what can we do uh, to attract young people to the field of material science and engineering? Well, I think first and foremost, we need to continue to educate um, young students that the opportunities that are available um, in the field are almost infinite. I think it's a mistake, and you know this because we had this conversation when you were a student, uh, as I'm sure. I tell all my PhD students, don't expect or try to get a job in exactly the same topic as your research topic. A PhD thesis is essentially a document that states that you can think independently, uh, that you can tackle a different, diff difficult problem uh, independently, and that you can accomplish a certain set of goals in three, four, five years. And so the same thing applies to all students at all ages, that they need to recognize the opportunities that exist in the field that are very broad. Mm -hmm. So as they go through school, um, increasing the toolbox of experiences of uh, techniques of uh, um, topics that they're familiar with will only increase the opportunities that they have. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it, this is a golden era for material science and engineering because if you look around every field, every important technical issue that's out there, it's touched one way or another by material science and engineering. So um, making sure people understand that uh, is important. We are at a disadvantage because, and societies are working on this, because material science and engineering is not a topic that high school students are familiar with. High school students are familiar with mechanical engineering, architecture, medicine, law. And so it is not a career that they choose coming into university. Uh, and so we need to do everything we can to make sure that they um, as early as possible, uh, high school, middle school, even elementary school kids are exposed to these, um, these concepts. Because quite frankly, the beauty of the field, unlike any other engineering field that I know, is the, its unique ability to combine elements of physics, elements of chemistry, elements of mechanical engineering um, in the same field in tackling an interesting problem. Uh, as opposed to looking at these problems from a purely mechanical engineering perspective or a purely chemical engineering perspective, the material scientist is really um, uh, allowed to use tools from all these fields to tackle a problem. And I just think that's fascinating. Is there anything else that, that you would like to add? So I, I, I do. I will end with... Um, there is a book that I first read as dean and that I now distribute to every dean, vice chancellor, or even senior faculty that we hire. And it was written by Stephen Sample, the former president of USC. And it's called A Contrarian's Guide to Leadership. And that's one of my favorite uh, books that talks about a very different way to think and pursue leadership that I happen to believe is, is, is quite accurate, so I recommend it. Finally, to wrap up, um, please uh, tell us what has been your favorite part of working in the field of material science and engineering. Also, what advice do you have for today's young leaders in the materials uh, profession? You know, the greatest um, pleasure continues to be um, the communities that, are, that I interact with, the students, the faculty, um, the staff uh, from all over the world. Um, their approach, probably influenced by the interdisciplinary nature of material science and engineering, tends to be very interdisciplinary. And I think that I think that helps establish um, a field that um, is very attractive. My advice is to students continue um, 
to explore, continue to learn. This is a unique time in your life, and I know you probably hear this many times over, but it really is to study things that interest you uh, and let your passion for learning um, drive you and surround yourself with people who contribute to the richness of your life rather than detract from it. What a fascinating career uh, you have had and what a pleasure to spend this time with you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lavania, for, for your willingness uh, to share your story with uh, IME. Thank you. Pleasure has been mine. 